right? Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Kanagavir. I'm part of the IAGS. I've been assigned the job of the moderator for this evening's program. This evening, we are going to have an international panel discussion through web link about the most challenging situation all of us are in. In this regard, may I request our president, Dr. Raman Goyal, Bokhat Hospital, Mumbai, to briefly tell us the activities being taken by the IAGS in COVID-19 infection regard, both on the social side and on the academic side and on the contribution. May I request of Raman Goyal to address us. Please unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the panel, people from US, from UK, Australia, and Indian faculty. Uh, my past president, Dr. Sandeep Das Gupta, who is going to chair this session. Uh, you know, the COVID has made things very difficult and has brought new challenges to us. We have never seen such situation in our lifetime, as we all know, but what Challenges, challenges it has brought to us are so different. So initially the idea was that what are the numbers, how the testing is being done. But what we are facing in India is entirely a different thing. Uh, there are hospitals after hospitals which are getting shut down. And these are the hospitals which are not actually getting shut down because they are treating COVID patients, but they are getting shut down because they are treating asymptomatic emergencies for other issues. So I think this panel is very important to bring clarity in the mind of those who are practicing surgery, whether they should test everybody before surgery or uh, since there are false, false negative uh, uh, rates with each of these tests, when which test should be done. And if the test comes negative, uh, do they, they abandon universal precautions? So I think this is what we are looking at uh, from the panelists today as one of the things, clarity about tests. And more important than that is the PPEs. PPE in India are available in market. So people are buying them, uh, the masks and the coveralls on their own. And on top of it, we have a policy where the, the government has very ambitiously said that anybody who is working in a, in a hospital, in a clinical setting, should use an N95 mask. The which, which is from very different from what NHS has in UK. So I think uh, uh, some more clarity about uh, a rational approach to use of PPEs and how we can conserve them from for our frontline warrior. Having said that, IAGS in last 15 days has transformed itself from an academic organization to a service organization. We have realized that physicians, anesthetists, our nurses, our ward assistants who are working in COVID hospital are at a great risk. And we have created a national structure to support them with PPEs because government is doing is very earnest, is working very hard. But obviously, it's a big country and the demands are too high. So I think we have created that structure, a centralized structure, a task force we have set up and we are able to deliver. On the other side, we have started this series of webinars. So there are two types of webinars. One is specialty webinars. So we had first webinar on cholecystectomy and appendicectomy in uh, COVID era, what should be done, what precautions to take, when it should be done. The second was on hernia. And then we have the next one coming on GI endoscopy. And these are the other webinars which Non-surgeons also attend, so there are physicians, family physicians, gynecologists, ENT surgeons, everybody is attending this, this particular webinar where we di disseminate information about COVID in general and how to protect and, and information to the physician at large. So I think uh, I, I would like to stop here. I would like Kanagwil to take over. Thank you so much for being there. I'll be there to ask you questions again at the end. Thanks for joining in our program. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, I have the honor of inviting our immediate past president, uh, Dr. Sainiv Das Gupta, sir, who is the chairman for this evening's program 
to briefly tell about this program and uh, introduce all the speakers for the evening. Good e Thank you, Kadagaval. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all these uh, national and international faculty, esteemed faculty, who has agreed to join here, even with the busy schedule. I would uh, just in short introduce to each one of them. First is Professor S. Raghunandan. He's a nodal officer, Tamil Nadu State COVID Control Room. He's a director and professor of internal medicine, Madras Medical College, Chennai. Then we have with us Mr. Pala Rajesh. He's the vice president of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. Mr. Pala Rajesh is the first Indian vice president to be elected to the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in the college in its 513 year history. He's originally from Chennai in India. He was a consultant for a sick surgeon at the Heartland Hospital in Birmingham prior to his recent retirement. He has been in the court of examiners of the college and is currently lead examiners of the Joint Surgical Fellowship Examinations in Cardiothoracic Surgery. He is the current lead for the RCES International Surgical Fellowship Program. Mr. Rajesh is currently a council member of the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery and deputy chair of the European Board of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Then we have Dr. G. V. Rao. He is the director, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. He is the chief of surgical gastroenterology and minimal invasive surgery. He obtained his MS from Bangalore Medical College and did his specialization in GI surgery at Madras Medical College. He underwent minimal invasive surgery training at Prince of Wales Hospital, Hong Kong, St. Mark's Hospital, London, and King's College, London. He is a pioneer in notes procedure. He has a special interest in HPV and foregut surgery, endoscopic surgery, and par oral transgastric endoscopic surgery. Then we have Dr. A. S. Bhalad. He is a public health specialist of infectious diseases, Division of Global Health Protection, India County Office, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in New Delhi. He supports infectious disease surveillance and a focus on activities related to improving the prevention, detection, and response to antimicrobial resistance and surveillance of healthcare associated infections in India. We have Dr. Vijay Kumar Velu. He's a senior translational research scientist and assistant professor, Yerkes Primate Research Center, Emory University, Atlanta. He specializes in cellular and humoral immune response to viral infections. We have Dr. Hemlata Varadhan. Is the, she's the deputy director, clinical microbiology and epidemiology, John Hunter Hospital. She's a a conjoint senior lecturer and research faculty in the University of New South Wales, Australia. She is a clinical microbiologist and a member of COVID-19 task force in Sydney. She specializes in super antigen issues and dual resistant patterns in virology. She is an expert in newer microbial diagnostics and antimicrobial drug resistance. So with that, we have all these esteemed faculty with us. And uh, we would start like to start the program with the first question, which goes to Dr. Dr. Raghunandan. Dr. Raghunandan, how is the testing going to be expanded in India? Uh, good evening, good morning to everybody here. First of all, I thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to share our experience in the last three months in the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, coming to your question, how is the testing going to be expanded in India? I think that is the uh, main focus in the last uh, three, four days, and it's going to be uh, expanded. The, the slogan given by the government is detect, encircle, and destroy, destroy corona. Detect, encircle, and destroy corona going to be the game changer. Again, the keyword is test, test, test. I'll just go back how we started. Because initially, you know, in government in, uh, in India, we have a Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and the ICMR. They have been giving the guidelines, whom to test, how to test like that. So it started with few countries. If they come from that country like that, it started slowly. And now we have come to an area where test as much as possible. So that is the one, uh, one criteria. 
and whom to test is the next criteria for example now the government has come out with very clearly like even low risk contacts of positive cases household contacts of even negative i'll i'll discuss something about the sensitivity and specificity of this test also so we are a little bit concerned about the even negative cases there may be some reasons why they are negative so now government has said low risk contacts of positive cases household they are high risk of negative cases also then we call it as sari that is severe acute respiratory infection anybody who has a sari should be tested then influenza like illness those have a mild upper respiratory illness in containment area this containment area in public health language the person who is having a positive is residing in a street so encircling 1 to 2 kilometers every household is being searched the uh, workers they go and search for any of those people are having any symptoms that can be suggested so that they call it as containment area so if any one of them in the containment area as influenza like illness they must be also be screened then on also the next target group is the labor migrant groups so they have included the labor uh, migrant areas also so these are the criteria now the government has expanded and now the number of testing facilities has also been increased now the icmr has also uh, come out that because the licensing and getting the approval were little bit uh, stringent because of the pandemic nature and now in our state itself we have given to eight private sectors and another 15 um, government institutions are also be added so what now government is now trying to achieve is instead of running the uh, this uh, uh, pcr test only once now they are running it 24 hours because at a time the uh, pcr machine can do it around 60 70 tests like that now we have increased the number of working hours so that it can do at least uh, up to 250 to 300 per day so like that if the number of centers are more the more uh, number of people can be screened and also the test reports can be generated within 24 hours because once you give the test the report also determines what next should be done for these patients coming back to to our rt pcr test of getting a swab test done we have some experience that i will share with you we have very interesting uh, scenarios for example a person has come with symptoms you are testing it the report comes as positive again we are admitting him and we are holding him for few days then there are some criteria of how to repeat the test also for example now the guideline says the patient should be symptom free for 48 hours then if the x ray shows some shadows initially that that shadow should have been cleared so these are the two criteria so that you can repeat the test so that we know the person has become negative so but we have to do two test within a matter of 24 hours so what happened was a patient comes to us with classical symptoms x ray ct suggested positive after 10 days we repeated the first sample it came as negative so within 24 hours we have to repeat the sample the repeat sample showed positive so there is conflict within the within 24 hours also the reports sometimes it become too conflicting when we looked into why it can be like that there are many factors one of the important factor we have to take it into consideration is how the technician takes a swab properly because if the technique is not right the report may have, will also differ so that is an important factor that we have to consider and some of them even though they are recovered they continue to remain positive that also we have seen that so ultimately at this moment where we are facing a war like situation in fact our beloved dean madam was saying assume every patient has covid positive take every precaution that is a simple advice but very serious one to be followed because we don't know how far it has gone to the community spread so that is the area now the whole india is watching initially we had the patients who had a foreign travel they were found positive we have managed them then we had few people who had a interstate travel like delhi uh, kerala like that who were coming from a infected state so we quarantined them whether that group has started spreading to other people who have not traveled at all within the community is the biggest challenge that is why this lockout also 
we have requested the government to extend it for two days so that all these people who are found to be positive, their contacts, if the contacts is positive, again, their contacts, something like a containment zone, screening must be focused. In fact, in our state, we have identified few districts out of 32 districts, around 10 districts has been identified where this containment activity is going to be on a war footing. So within these two weeks, once we screen the population who are at high risk, then we can be sure that we are able to control the uh, community spread. So these are the special initiatives that has been taken to expand the testing facilities in our state. And also our state government has formed a special team. Yesterday, Honorable Minister has announced, I mean, Chief Minister has announced, every district will have a one IAS officer and one IPS officer who will monitor whether this containment screening has been going on properly because you know some of them know they were refusing to come for testing. So that is why sometimes they have to use the police help to get them, uh, bring them for testing. And one, one more initiative what we have done in our state is testing at the doorstep. It's because sometimes they are because of transport, lack of transport and other things. Now, government, especially in the city of Chennai, uh, corporation has set up around 10 to 12 centers, testing centers across the zones where the people can be tested in the same, so they have identified some common place where they can come and give the test and go. If, but of course, they have to follow the 14 days quarantine. If the test is positive, those people, that containment zone, if the test is positive, they have to come to the hospital for a better monitoring. So with this, I'll just uh, stop answering for this particular question. Any questions further on this subject, I can take it. I would like to ask you the next question. In okay. conclusion of whatever you have said, in okay. fact, uh, we are very happy to note the amount of effort the medical team and the state administration have put in. The question now interviewing for the health service providers is most importantly, prior to undertaking any emergency medical or surgical intervention, yes. what is the status and what is going to be the direction we should take regarding to the testing alone? Are we to do testing if prior to the procedure number one? If yes, what is the test and at what frequency? Please highlight on these three issues. Okay, okay sir. That's a very pertinent questions for surgeons especially. All of you know already that all the elective sur surgeries to be deferred. I think that's better, number one. When yes. you're taking up uh, emergency surgeries, especially like uh, LSES for the position side like that, I'll give you some practical uh, tips which will be very to be put into use very practically. For example, even if somebody is tested, I suppose some of the people are asking, go and get tested. I will tell you from our little experience of managing more than uh, 200, 300 patients in the last two, three months, even if the test is negative, don't think he is really negative. We have observed that phenomena. So I will give you some clinical, for example, ask him whether he has traveled recently out of his local uh, place or has he been in contact with some other person who is tested positive or whether that person has visited him because they are all high risk group. Number three, I'll do it because routinely we do for any emergency, you do a hemogram, no? So you can just interpret the what we call it as NLR ratio, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. For example, if the neutrophil by lymphocyte ratio is more than three, it is significant and if it is more than eight, Definitely, suspicion is very high. So I think that anybody can interpret. We just put the neutrophil count divided by the lymphocyte count. Third, what I would suggest is ask him to do a single breath test. What we call it as by holding the breath, a normal person should be able to count loudly up to 30. This is a rough criteria the expert committee has also suggested. For example, one, two, three, four, to just to know whether his respiratory status is fine. Then, of course, you are going to do a X-ray chest as a routine for any emergency. So, have a look at the X-ray. Does it show any shadowing or something like that? If it is so, plan for a CT chest also. This, again, we have learned in the last uh, 10 days is even if the patient is asymptomatic, even if the patient is asymptomatic, if you take an X-ray, it is showing some shadow. And we are really surprised when you plan for a CT, it is, it is showing much more than... So, symptom and sign correlation is very less. 
so ultimately what i would advise for the surgeons who are taking up the emergency procedure is get a good history from the patient and the relatives do this basic parameters and especially when you are planning for a general anesthesia procedure it is a aerosol generating procedures now we have come out with various protective uh, uh, the gadgets for the anesthetist you are going to intubate we have one introduced the video laryngoscope so that the distance between the so i mean the anesthetist and the patient can be minimized number two they can wear a shield that they can wear it and also they, they have, we have uh, devised a small uh, what do you call it as a tube like thing plastic made of plastics so that can be hood it is something like a hood they can keep it over the patient's head so that even if the i think that whatsapp is going on in the thing you can just how, how that hood can protect the uh, anesthetist who is intubating thing so what my suggestion would be since this outbreak is going on we have to take as a doctor we have to protect ourselves with utmost uh, precaution and even if you are strongly suspicion of that particular case better better you apart from your theater dress you put the ppe what is has been advocated um what is your take on pre operative testing sir that's what i'm saying you if you want to do a test you do it but don't get carried away if the test is negative that's what that is the point i want to tell you point is taken sir yeah I'm because good. they are knowing that asymptomatic uh, people carriers are there they are transmitting the virus in the community all so many things are being uh, being talked about that is why i said everybody is positive unless proved otherwise i mean unless proved means even the test that is why it can fool us because we are just now we are doing a small audit now for example how many of them are having a uh, x ray shadows even if the reports are negative thank you sir um with that one uh, pertinent question to dr ragunandan uh, can you advise us what is the status of blood transfusion in this uh, uh, group especially when you are going to plan for a emergency surgery what are the precautions we one should take prior to planning a blood transfusion based on surgical indications you mean yes sir surgically patient needs a transfusion okay okay, okay. from the perspective yeah. of what is that going to happen if you are going to use the blood what precautions we are only thing is fluid fluid management has to be a little bit careful because these people they can have hemodynamic instability so is in uh, normal blood to be replaced when there is a loss of blood that is not an issue but when you are doing a passive blood transfusions we especially when you are dealing with old people with some comorbid illness like cardiac problem or the ischemic heart disease like that so be in touch with your uh, physician or the critical care intensivist regarding the fluid calculation you have to be careful because fluid uh, uh, protocols have to be strictly followed in these patients there are some reports of corona virus affecting the heart directly also so we can give blood transfusion there is no contraindication for blood transfusion but compared to other uh, scenarios in covid we have to be careful regarding the fluid overload we have to take it into consideration is there any precaution the blood bank has to check the serology yes, negativity sir, of the donor blood no no at present i don't think uh, in fact the issue was getting the donors because of this lockouts the blood bank is not able to conduct a normal uh, camps which they used to con uh, conduct normally so now they have contact numbers of the routine blood blood donors which they come so they are able to arrange blood all those things but there is no separate screening whether those patients are having a better is if the patient is suffering from lri uri better not to take blood I mean, uh, get the blood from these people at present at present there's no more screening for any corona in the blood thank you sir thank you now i move on to the next pertinent question to dr hemlata varadan dr hemlata can you unmute yourself so the two questions uh, what is the policy being followed in your center or in australia testing in symptomatic and testing in asymptomatic patients right this is for both elective and uh, 
people who are going to have a planned surgery or a planned therapy what is the present uh, strategy australian health ministry is advocating for the practitioners regarding testing in symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who come for non covid treatment in any health setup Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. And it's thanks for the opportunity. Um, so firstly, I will talk in general terms about testing. Now, different countries have different strategies, depending on the availability of resources, as well as the uh, status of pandemic or the, um, um, the pandemic stage that they are in. So in Australia, at this point in time, we screen as many people as possible because we believe that increased case finding leads to um control isolation contact tracing and and further control and therefore a strict testing strategy has been expanded to a larger a wider group um so we essentially screen anyone for symptomatic patients we have a very low threshold to screen people who present with flu like illness and the flu like illness is defined as fever plus or minus acute respiratory syndrome um now we have seen that a lot of a uh, good proportion of patients with um covid infection need not have fever and therefore that is not one of our major criteria and the other thing we do is we um we screen people particularly healthcare workers who present with um a more even a modest increase in temperature as well as um any any mild or moderate respiratory tract infection and of course the um in the community setting um the aged care residents as well as people who are believed to be in close contacts and needless to say um any uh, for return travelers so we have expanded testing and every time we see that the the testing numbers actually go high and that's put a lot of pressure in the test on the testing labs as well as in the availability of testing kits but we believe that more testing means more detection of cases um more isolation measures and um precautions that we can take now this is this is about testing in symptomatic population we don't undertake testing in asymptomatic population um partly because we are very mindful of again as i said the availability of reagents at this point in time we know that the virus can be shed in upper respiratory secretions at least 1 to 2 days before the onset of symptoms so um the testing you you can do a testing today and it'll come back as negative and um you you shouldn't be falsely reassured that it is completely negative and also um we the only group that we actually chase in um in terms of asymptomatic population is a close contacts of um established cases so that's the only scenario that we do an asymptomatic testing on so this is in general population now coming to um prior to surgery i think professor raghunandan raised a very very valid point now you do testing only if it brings back a result that you can act on a clinically meaningful time frame now with a lot of your emergency surgeries you're not going to be able to get a result um any before than 24 hours um depending on where your testing is being done and what sort of testing you do so if you're um uh, well requesting for an rt pcr usually the laboratory will take a, a, at least a hour to two for extraction of nucleic acid and then to run the assay as such so they can't run any more than 2 to 3 runs a day so which means that your possibility of getting a result before 24 hours is a little bit uh, i would say slim so in that case it totally becomes a counterproductive exercise so my suggestion and and of course it will be uh based on your ministerial ad- advice but in australia at least we follow a risk matrix where we see whether the patient stands a high risk based on whether they are close contacts of a case or whether they have had symptoms uh, like flu like illness in the past or whether they belong to the cluster we we have defined clusters going on at this point in time we know where they are and therefore we try and this particular patient comes from that cluster and also depending on the type of surgery that we are performing um and any upper endoscopy surgery means high risk needless to say and therefore we um go for full ppe and also mindful about the availability of ppe we try to 
um, minimize as much as possible to um, to patients who are at high risk and to certain surgeries that definitely require a PPE. Okay, uh, point is taken. At this point, we are, there are enough and enough newer modality of testing. In fact, the early thing was PCR, later antibody test came. Now I was told there is even a spot test method, which is like your glucometer or something like that. So with these three things, and I think a lot of more things are going to come, especially when you people speak about the asymptomatic patients, are the negative uh, investigations still going to turn positive at a later point of these type of window group of patients. Having this in mind, like it is definitely pertinent to understand, treat everyone as positive unless proved otherwise. That is an easy way to look at things. But the regulatory norms in different countries tell something different in the way designated COVID centers are free to take care of this policy of treat everything positive. The challenge comes when an emergency is taken up in an institution where we do not have designated centers. And if it turns positive, then it becomes a challenge for the administrators and the treating surgeon. With that in mind, can you address us? What is the gold standard of the test? And what way we are progressing towards the type of test which is going to define in the future? Because this is going to be a long-term problem. That's what the data which is uh, right now emerging tell us. On that mind, which is the best test available right now? And what is going to be the future direction? So the best test or the gold standard that um, everyone uses, and I think once what we believe in is the RT-PCR, which is um, being employed by many laboratories, which is, in other words, um, detecting ribonucleic acid of the virus um, that is present in a symptomatic or asymptomatic person. Um, now, the other tests that are being developed are of two types. One is direct detection of um, nucleic acid um, based on a minimal sampling, like what you said, um, and, and also a rapid version of those, which can give us a result in 45 minutes um, to help with your decision making. And the other type of tests are testing for immune response. In other words, the serology or looking at the IgM and IgG antibodies that are mounted in response to the infection. Now, the, the former, which is the direct detection of antigen, is obviously helpful, and it's also highly sensitive. And usually you will get a, a positive result as obtained in a patient who is anywhere between um, the first to fifth day of illness. And that tends to persist for quite some time, as Professor Raghunandan said. And the, and um, with us, with our experience, we have seen a patient who is still testing positive after nearly 21 days. Or the reports from China say that you can have a positivity up to 28 days with these antigen tests. They're highly, highly sensitive. But with the tests that detect the immune response, say, for example, your IgM and IgG, um, lack sensitivity in the sense that they, the antibodies start appearing only at day 8 to 10 of illness. They are much quicker than what we saw with SIRS, um, but it is not a timely enough test for us to be able to use at the setting. So once your disease establishes itself in the community, once it becomes rapid, then um, all you need to see is whether this patient is whether he or she is exposed to the exposed to the virus or not. In which case, your serology becomes useful. But at this point in time, where we are still detecting cases, I I fail to believe that the serology will help at least for um, decision making with surgery. And this is based on Australian experience, but countries may differ. Okay, so. Assuming we do a surgery for a patient, as you rightly said, five days after the first testing to go for the second testing. In resource constrained situation, this five days testing is directed by the symptom or five days by the duration so that the nucleic acids by then tend to appear. What is the rationale of your thought telling day one testing and day five testing in patients who are undergoing medical care? No, no, I'm not saying that you have to repeat testing at day five. I'm saying in a symptomatic patient, you are likely to detect the virus in good amounts between day one and day five. That is where the virus peaks in the upper respiratory tract. 
is what I'm saying. We certainly don't advise repeat testing, at least until the patient becomes asymptomatic. And we do have a different criteria for retesting patients. And it is predominantly for clearing them and also to be able to allow them to move into the community. But we never recommend repeat testing before the 14-day mark because, we have, as I said, we have seen that the virus persists for a longer time, at least for three weeks. And also because your test is extremely sensitive, you're detecting at least 100 copies of RNA, whereas the amount of virus that's in your throat at day five is around 10 to the power of six. So you can imagine how sensitive the tests are. I understand. And um, to have some insight on the basics of virology, are we seeing mutations as we come from November end was the first reported case. We are now three, four months down the first reported case. And I hope you have access to the genetic uh, genome map uh, uh, data from the Wuhan first uh, institution which we picked up. And now what you are seeing in your center, do you still have the same uh, gene coding or do we have a difference in uh, from the strain now what we are seeing and what it was initially? Look, my understanding is that there's no major differences that we are seeing, although that there was an information about two different types of strains, um, L strain and S strain that was reported quite some time. But at least from our experience, we don't think that it's mutated to a larger extent. But there are some interesting information that's coming, emerging out of um, uh, some of the articles that I've recently read where they look at the differences between your um, the viruses that are in your upper respiratory tract whereas, uh, with compared to the virus in the low respiratory tract. And certainly they see that there are subtle mutations or subtle genetic um, expression uh, differences even within the same person. So what it tells us is that you can have, it may be the same virus, but you can have a differential genetic expression in various sites of your body, particularly the sputum versus a, a throat swab. And this also tells us that you can have active replication going on in your upper respiratory tract. And that might throw some implications for you surgeons and also for anesthetic people in that any, any intervention in your upper respiratory tract is really um, uh, an aerosol generating procedure and we should take precautions, adequate precautions. One last question to you in this scratch. Do you mean to say there is a differential load in respiratory tract and gastrointestinal tract? That's an interesting thought, yes. So I, I can't tell you accurately that there is a differential expression, but what we have certainly seen is there is there are ACE2 inhibitors in your gastrointestinal tract, as we all know, and there certainly is um, genetic expression and active replication that can happen within the GIT. And we know that the feces can carry uh, uh, viral RNA. Let us get her online now once her connectivity is fine. Now we move on to Emma, you are okay? I don't know how far they can be cultured, although, sorry, I think my... The last few statements you can repeat and close. Emma, I think we will get back to you shortly because of your connectivity issues. Now, I will move on to Dr. Rajesh, Mr. Rajesh. Um, sir, what is that, uh, the challenges you are facing on the health resource management in from an operative or a surgical perspective? Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Firstly, yes. I'd like to congratulate IAGS for doing um, and facilitating this seminar. It's wonderful to listen to various people from uh, various countries about their recent experiences and allowing all of us to share our experiences. <clears throat> to your question, this, if you like, is an unprecedented crisis. And most governments are meant to have been preparing 
for this sort of pandemics due to previous experiences. However, this has been really like a storm. Uh, and what we have done in the United Kingdom is to get a host of organizations, including the four royal colleges, the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland, the Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland, and the General Surgical Body together to put together a guidance on how to manage um, the surgical um, problems that we have with COVID and non-COVID groups. So what did we do? We initially set up what we thought would be a reasonable way of um, managing the COVID patients. We said step one, stay away, stay at home, wait until you have symptoms. If you do not have symptoms, then let it go. Step two, if you have symptoms, isolate for 14 days. If you're better, let it go. Step three, if you need hospitalization, then at hospital, you will be tested. Now, step four is when patients arrive as emergencies to the institution, to the hospital, through the emergency department. And if they do come as emergencies, they normally come as people with gross breathlessness. They're immediately tested. And if they're COVID positive or non-COVID positive, they are put, in the, put into ICUs accordingly. So this, if you like, was an initial method of treating all of the patients who came to the NHS hospitals. Now, the second thing we did was to divide the hospitals um, areas, receiving areas as COVID areas and non-COVID areas. Now, I'm going to just um, pertain myself to the non-COVID areas. In the non-COVID areas, we made sure that the ICU spaces were made available to patients who were admitted to the hospital, full stop. Then we made sure that we had only three operating theaters in each hospital. The three operating theaters were for the emergency patients who came in, mainly general surgery, the obstetric patients who needed um, a theater for their cesarean sections, and a theater which was meant purely for trauma. So we had three operating theaters only functional. The rest of the operating theaters were used as an extension for intensive care so that we had adequate beds for the intensive care overflow. Now, with the non-COVID patients, what we did was we said that there should be surgical prioritization. We called it level one, level two, level three, and level four. Now, level one was again divided into two, level 1A as emergency and level 1B as urgent. Now, emergency were patients who needed surgery within 24 hours. 1B was patients who needed surgery within 72 hours. Level two was surgery up to four weeks. Level three was surgery up to three months. And level four was surgery which can be deferred for greater than three months. So if you like, we had a surgical categorization and prioritization. Then I heard about PPE. We have had a lot of um, problems with procuring adequate PPE for the NHS staff. So PPE, according to the government, we've gone through two phases. One, they said that we needed full PPE for most of the frontline health workers. Now they've gone back to saying just surgical masks, aprons, and double gloving is sufficient for people who are in the ward areas. But in the theater areas, we need to have full PPE, especially if patients arrive during this time. Testing is concerned. Um, we have had various debates. 
Now, we've heard from the experts this in the panel that you can test, but does it make any difference if they've come into hospital? Do we retest? We don't know. So we, again, consider what Professor Raghunandan said about everybody is COVID positive until proven otherwise. The government testing initially there was a time when we had some data saying that 44,246 patients were tested, but only 4,000 patients were proven positive. So if there's a 10% yield from a cohort, then clearly there's resource implications. So we felt that anybody who went into hospital should be tested. Again, we talked about asymptomatic patients. Now, for asymptomatic patients, if anybody came in with an abdominal emergency, then if he or she was going to receive a CT scan as a part of the investigation, then a chest scan could also be done so that we can look at any abnormalities in the lungs. But if a clinician felt that a COVID positive a COVID test was necessary, then it behoves on the clinician to make that decision. So a lot of common sense on the ground was the um, key that each hospital in the NHS decided that they would do. I'm sorry about that. Yes, sir. Uh, to your point of managing or strategizing the resources are well appreciated, sir. My question next to you is, in the same hospital, like assuming you have a big hospital or a teaching hospital, how do you segregate treating positive patients and treating COVID negative patients? Like, do we have separate institutionals dedicated for COVID? or inside the same same campus you get to dedicate separate areas for this and that? Yes. <clears throat> and well, what we tend to do is that we have two different entries into the hospital. You have an emergency department, which is a single entry for all of the emergency patients when, um, when a normal working of the hospital happens. But as soon as we got to this COVID situation, we created a separate entry for the non-COVID patients. See, patients who came in as emergencies, patients who came in as, you know, urgent but planned operative procedures, because I must inform you that we have not stopped operating in the NHS. I know we said that the um, NHS, I mean, the, some of the hospitals have stopped complete um, operations for uh, elective patients. That is not the case in, the, in a lot of the institutions. We're still continuing. But what we are doing is to select the patients because we've got huge waiting lists in the country, you know, and if, if we stop completely, then the waiting list will just go through the roof. So that group of patients who come in, who have um, day case procedures, who are diagnostic, who will have minimal invasive procedures, especially in the chest and can leave by the next day, you know, that sort of very careful choosing is going on. So we've completely segregated the hospitals into non-COVID and COVID sections in the same campus. That's what we've done. Now, as far as theater is concerned, we only allow minimum number of staff, four per theater. And the appropriate PPE is for all staff in theater, depending on role and risk. All of them have to don PPE in theater. You know, And if the procedure is very long, like in... Um, you know, oral surgery or cardiac surgery, then we need to have team changes, you know, during the procedure for prolonged procedures. And all higher risk patients are intubated and extubated in the operating theater with these shields, which have been now designed uh, not very far from Birmingham in Coventry. And we're using them uh, to intubate the patients. Um, at this point of time, uh, the post or uh, post intubation, the surgical procedure as such. Initially, they said minimal invasive procedures have higher risk. 
now the societies are migrating towards being it is a closed procedure the aerosol generation as long as we use the appropriate filters are relatively safe in compared to open procedure so what is at this point of time having having the option of both minimal invasive and open surgery what is your take on it from the nhs perspective see we we felt that um any operation where aerosol generating procedures um are regularly performed they are considered a high risk clinical area and full ppe is advised for these for this procedures if we can defer diagnostic procedures especially endoscopies because endoscopies upper gi endoscopies are aerosol generating procedures you know the patients can cough and splutter when um you know you pass an endoscope so again very careful you know um prioritization of who needs a diagnostic procedure who needs a therapeutic procedure is done on an mdt basis i know that one of the questions is going to be on mdt later so i i just want to say that that is something that we do on a daily basis and then what we tend to do is to make sure that full ppe consists of disposable gloves a fluid repellent gown eye and face protection and an ffp2 or 3 mask this is imperative if not available the procedure will not be done because the frontline workers are now beginning to feel that if they are going to be exposed then we may lose workforce because at the minute 30% of the nhs workforce have gone down with covid or self isolation so we got to be very careful i have one extension of a question in fact from the group i've been back with questions um i now get a very clear picture how nhs and the uk is going on to the surgical part of it so if we are going to uh, get into a situation where a surgery is completed day 2 or day 3 the operating surgeon or one of the medical professional involved in the care turns positive what is the next step in this situation okay can you what what happens if the team turns positive because if it's a surgeon and one other in the uh, team then the whole team is isolated they have to be so you know on isolation for a two week period and only after that two week period if they have been deemed to be negative because they are tested because they've got to go back to front line even that there is a controversy whether they should be tested or not but if they become asymptomatic if they are better they return to work after two weeks but that whole team is isolated what happens in the facility where the procedure has and uh, been uh, procedure has been uh, happening in the ot if it is a complex of theaters or the icu where other patients have shared the icu what really happens to the other co patients during this 3 uh, days or 4 days or whatever all, all all of these patients are all isolated and they are all deemed as covid positive and they are treated expectantly as covid positive patients the nhs staff it's it's a very complex area this because if you're tested on day 1 and you're negative and you're continuing to work as an icu um specialist there's no saying that you may be positive the following week so until you're symptomatic you continue to work in that area with ppe what is taken sir um the question of decision tree in surgery you have very nicely categorized 1 2 3 how to uh, go on the surgical decision the role of mdt is in making a decision about surgery for a covid positive patient or a covid symptomatic patient and role of conventional existing mdts like for instance in oncology mdts in other uh, audit mdts of morbidity meetings and other things how does this covid mdt differ from the other which are existing mdts and how much it influences the regular mdt's decision okay 
what we have done here is in every regular MDT, patients, for example, colorectal surgery, thoracic surgery, you know, urology, the whole lot, all the cancer patients are sent for discussion. Every cancer patient in the United Kingdom is discussed in an MDT so that we have a register depending on which stage is it, whether it's stage one to stage four. Every patient is discussed. Now, based on the stage of the patient, some difficult decisions are being made. Anybody who's in stage three and above who has a limited um, three-year or five-year survival is discussed very uh, cautiously. And if they do have a um, decision to be made about surgery versus chemotherapy and radiotherapy, they are being told that they will be better off receiving chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Now, stage one patients who are asymptomatic, again, a difficult decision. For three months, what is the tumor doubling time? Will they become upstaged? Some may become upstaged, we don't know. But is this something we can do? And then the collect the patients who you think are, are going to need urgent surgery and discuss with a senior medical director colleague as to who is going to get the operations on a daily basis because we have a cancer theater. You know, do we get the guy with a expanding, you know, tumor in his brain to have his neurosurgery? Do we get the chap who's got a huge tumor in his mandible to have his you know, max fact surgery or whatever, but these patients will have to be counseled very clearly that this is a high risk procedure and the chances are that they may get into um, a COVID positive state. That's number one. Number two, the guys who are coming for planned surgery who have come up to the list and they say they still want to come in, that's a very difficult decision as well because they may get a complication after surgery and need an ICU bed. And if they get into an ICU bed, they may become COVID positive and they may, you know, uh, have a predilection to die. So that's another very complex area to counsel patients. We, we, we've said that anybody who needs an anastomosis, please put a stoma for the time being and bring them back later. So those are the kind of things that um, we are... Uh, doing at the present time, but we're receiving a lot of feedback. So, because like we all discussed now, this is dynamic. It changes from day to day. You know, today's guidelines, we, we've actually gone up to updating our guidelines. So, things may change as uh, time path progresses on this particular catastrophe. Thank you, sir. Now, I move a little back to uh, basic sciences. Uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Velu. Uh, what is the most uh, important update you have for us from the vaccine perspective? It looks like we are not still seeing at a light at the long tunnel of COVID. So you being into the basic vaccine research, what is the current update about the vaccine and how far we are away from the vaccine? Thank you. Thanks for the organizers for giving me an opportunity. Uh, well, we have right now um, a five-candidate vaccine um, um, all, of, all of them are in phase one trial, and a couple of them are from US. Um, and then we have more, I think that in this phase, you know, a lot of many uh, biotech companies as well as research institutes are actually going in a fast direction to get a vaccine, one or the other vaccine. So there are um, more than 60 uh, companies of work, uh, institutions and companies are working on vaccines. And um, to start with, the two vaccines that uh, US is developing, one is uh, uh, an uh, mRNA uh, novel lipid uh, nanoparticle vaccine. Uh, this is a collaborate, uh, collaboration from Moderna company in US uh, with uh, NIH, National Institute of Health. I think they fast track this vaccine. Right now, uh, it's in phase two, uh, phase one trial, and then um, uh, they are testing it in uh, uh, volunteers to get to see whether this vaccine induces a good antibody response. And uh, a second vaccine from uh, U.S. is from uh, Inovia. This is uh, a DNA vaccine. Uh, they plan to uh, use uh, a 
in it to see that there is a good antibody response. Another three vaccines from China were advanced with the adenovirus vaccine. Um, they're testing it in, uh, uh, in China where uh, they're also using the S protein of uh, uh, the virus. And again, there are two other virus vaccines. They use linky virus as a vector. And they're planning to modify the disease. Uh, also, they are, they are going to give, I mean, uh, try to elicit a uh, CTO response to these vaccines. Again, they also have an uh, other vaccine uh, with an artificial uh, antigen pressing cell. So that, you know, again, this is also uh, based on an, uh, uh, viral vectors. You know, they time to elicit both the uh, innate as well as the T cell arms of the vaccine. And this is again, uh, this is a prophylactic vaccine that they have right now. And uh, in terms of therapeutic, you know, uh, as you all know that right now the convalescent plasma is one of the key things, you know, from plasma taken from the patients might be helpful for the uh, people, uh, particularly who, who will have the severe or uh, critical stage of illness. I think in uh, New York, people are uh, also testing this. And, and current situation for the, when the therapeutic is like only one, uh, particularly the convalescent plasma. And then, as I said earlier, for prophylactic, we have like four in uh, pipeline and candidate as a phase one vaccine. So still many uh, will be coming, but the FDA is kind of approving uh, uh, a lot of vaccines, you know, uh, to be tested in phase one. But the thing is, uh, as you said, you know, it's not... Uh, it's not um, maybe you know it's not in near future near future and it's going to take some time because uh, the, these vaccines are tested for the safety and um, again um, for the immunogenicity and all the stuff and then we are we are developing an animal model as well uh, to test these vaccines in animals and a lot a lot of animal models is available but then uh, we are we are finding something uh, particularly we from the uh, primate center trying to develop an animal model to test a vaccine uh, with a, a similar pathology that we see in humans. So these are all you know, uh, actually going on in the US as well as in different parts of the world. So it will take another, I think, probably a year or so to get a vaccine. Uh, right now, these are in the testing stage. We don't know how the immune response is going to be. And then again, um, after the immune response, we don't know what would be the status uh, of, uh, of protection. That's very important. So. Until or unless we know these things, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't have a vaccine, clear vaccine. So, considering the polyvalent serum therapy, which you claim that we have reasonable results, these uh, polyvalent serums are the, especially the antibodies from cured patients. Right. So are I think they, uh, I let me finish. Are they sourced as a pre-manufactured therapy? or we can identify a patient who is fully cured, declared cured, and do a pheresis and take the plasma and use like any other blood product to the uh, posit or, uh, patient who are in type 3 infections or so. Yeah. So I think at this point, uh, at least in the US, as you know, that's, we have more than 5 lakhs people infected with this virus. And then uh, uh, most of them are in the I mean, Most we see a higher death right now. Uh, but what they were trying to do right now in New York is that you know, they take the plasma from these people, you know, from the uh, acute patients, and then they're infusing them to the, the severe, particularly they recommend it for the severe patients so that they can get the viral load down. So that that is one, so one, one thing is happening. And the thing, another, other thing is happening, like the people are also trying to um, isolate B cells from these uh, patients. Um, so they sort the B cells and then I think Mount Sinai, as well as even an Emery, we are doing, uh, uh, headed by Rafi Ahmad. You know, we are, what we are planning to do is to um, uh, isolate a B cell and then clone the one that has a very good nucleosing capacity and then expand those B cells. You now, those research is also going on. You know, probably that might be a, a promising one. And uh, and uh, these are the current two options that we have. But then, uh, for answering your question in a precise way, that right now they are doing taking the plasma and then. Um, and giving it to the uh, patients to, to get rid of the virus in the se severe cases. Do we have any exciting targets apart from vaccine, uh, new drug points, or whatever we have spoken so far? Is, yeah. or is the uh, translational research inching towards something which we have not spoken so far, which could be a potential future therapy? 
see that uh, in terms of the therapy, you know, there are, uh, uh, so you all know that, you know, the uh, hydrochloroquine is actually working. Some, some patients working, somebody's not working. It's uh, kind of debatable right now. But then um, there is a recent paper, like a couple of days, I think yesterday, I guess, there's a paper on remdesivir. Uh, as you all know, that is actually working. At least 68 percentage of uh, patients are being uh, cured by this particular drug. Probably combination of these two might also work. Uh, I think we should, at this point, we should try the way, I mean, whatever is actually working, we should try and see uh, the, the effectiveness of the, those therapy. But at the same time, uh, we should also be very careful with the safety of those drugs. You know, um, pumping drugs into um, patients is not going to help, you know, that also create a, a different pathology. So we need to be careful while uh, administering those drugs to those uh, individuals. And I think we should have a strict guidelines for uh, how, how many, uh, how much dose has to be used and then you know, moving forward with these uh, studies you know probably we'll know more how how much we need to uh, we need to give them the dose and all this stuff but the uh, remdesivir is actually showing a very good uh, sign at least 68 percent of them are uh, uh, getting cured of this virus in, in the project Mar. and uh, now we move on to dr gv rao to so back to your clinical uh, clinician um sir uh, like you are the one of the pioneer centers on the World Gastroenterology Association recognized uh, endoscopy center. Still, by and large, endoscopy and endoscopic diagnosis one side and endotherapy on the other side is a very major bridge between the surgery and the medical management of any patient for the matter. So from uh, being a pioneer center in your center, how do you stratify or what are the challenges you face? Let us first talk about where endoscopy is allowed. If allowed, what are the precautions or what are the uh, risk stratification you do? And then how do we execute the real-time endoscopy? Uh, thank you, Kangibal. Actually, beautiful input from different parts of the world in this uh, uh, crucial COVID crisis. Uh, very pertinent question in this, actually. There are several aerosol generating procedures that we talk about. And endoscopy is one of the aerosol generating procedure. And obviously, when you have an aerosol generating procedure, we have to have all possible precautions that we have to take to do these procedures. Now, first and foremost, like we categorize the surgical procedures, actually very beautifully uh, classified and what Dr. Rajesh has told us into different uh, types of uh, categorization of patients. Even the endoscopic side, the different societies have come up with different guidelines. And then as in today, endoscopy is restricted only to emergency endoscopy. In the sense like you have a foreign body that cannot be passed out. You have a bleeding patient that cannot be uh, managed conservatively. These are the patients who are taken up for emergency, uh, for emergency endoscopy. And like we follow, like we having uh, the protocols we follow in the uh, operating room, Whatever protocols Dr. Rajesh has said, all these protocols are followed in the endoscopy room, have to be followed in the endoscopy room, both as regards the endoscopist, the, 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 uh, the endoscopy technicians, the endoscopy nurses, and the uh, doctors who are involved in it. And the patient obviously has to be protected from all these things. Uh, this emergency versus elective uh, procedures, actually, basically the entire concept of uh, trying to avoid elective procedures for the time being is to conserve and protect both the health healthcare workers, both the doctors and the healthcare workers for an anticipated crisis. It is likely that we are, I mean, all of a sudden we are uh, pushed in to see a lot of these patients who are coming in. So we have to protect the healthcare workers for an anticipated crisis. At the same time, the other reason for stopping elective procedures is to conserve whatever resources that we have for these COVID emergencies. Unless and until we conserve these resources that we have, be it be any resource, be it be healthcare personnel, be it be personal protective equipment, or be it the financial thing, we have to conserve all this for an anticipated crisis. Hopefully, we don't have this crisis, but if at all it comes, we have to be prepared for it. So the entire reasoning of shutting down the elective procedures, both on the endoscopy side and on the surgical side, is to basically protect, save health personnel and also the resources. 
and the other thing uh, the modality of what how we treat this patient is all depends on how this virus moves and how this virus survives actually rajesh has uh, given very beautiful guidelines actually uh, see basically uh, we have to cut surgery is one of these highest risk procedures if you talk about the aerosol generating procedures surgery involves umpteen number of aerosol generating procedures right from intubation ventilation extubation uh, even a nasogastric tube insertion is considered an aerosol generating procedure and we may have to do an endoscopy before during and after the pr procedure and the amount of nebulization that these patients have to undergo the amount of chest physiotherapy that these patients have to undergo all are aerosol generating procedures so surgery is absolutely one of the highest risk procedures that we are talking about in the current scenario because of the complex number of aerosol procedures that is involved for this reason i think uh, and because of the limitation of the testing facility that we have obviously i mean different parts of the country has got different protocols uh, we also increasing our testing facility in our own part of the world but still there are a lot of limitations so as and when the patient walks in very rightly said by dr raghunandan irrespective of whatever status it comes we treat the patient if the patient has to be taken for an emergency kind of surgery or an emergency endoscopy he has to be taken treated as a positive covid positive patient and take all possible precautions you are not only protecting the patient but you are protecting the healthcare workers uh, so basically it, it all depends on how this virus is moving and how this virus survives uh, for this reason i think we have to appeal uh, i i personally feel that uh, I, uh, elective procedures especially in our part of the world have to be totally shut down uh, till we are sure because we still in very very infancy we don't know how it the entire thing behaves how it multiplies we are absolutely unaware of all the thing we are just taking some data from whatever we have in the past we have some data from the other uh, uh, infectious diseases we are pulling in that and trying to make some guidelines a very beautiful word that was coined by the royal college of surgeons thank you thank you very much rajesh a beauty, very beautiful word with this coined was common sense common sense common sense in addition to whatever guidelines whatever you have i think common sense is what is important to make sure that you protect both the healthcare workers and the patients in this period of crisis very actually in fact when i was trying to trying to do my presentation i was worried whether i could use this word common sense but i think in the present day it makes a lot of sense actually this single word in that entire guideline that you made people have made is very apt in the current uh, day scenario Anugal, I can't hear you. Uh, Sahinda sir, please unmute your mic and ask the question, sir. Uh, Dr. Jivira, a very beautiful said. Say, I have another question. What do you think is our future? I mean, how soon do you see, foresee, we going back to our normal activities, normal surgeries and uh, normal procedures that we do? Uh, sir, uh, actually, again, a very beautiful question. Now, covid is now is becoming a stigma right now whether you like it or not it has become a stigma it has become a social stigma even if you say tomorrow if you open up your hospitals and say the hospital is welcome and you're open up the thing i don't think patients are going to walk in just like that i think patients have that common sense also i think they will take their own decision i think and i think before we say that we are open to all sort of elective procedures i think we have to make sure that the entire curve is flattened and make sure that we have isolated those patients make sure that we have as uh, uh, rajesh has said we have covid positive hospitals covid positive facilities covid negative facilities actually again a beautiful thing that was done in italy actually they have totally separated the covid positive facilities from covid negative we cannot have all covid positive facilities and then we will not have any other facilities to treat any other patients actually so i think it is going to be maybe few weeks to months before we going to come back to normalcy of what we have done it is not going to be days i think it's going to be weeks to months before we come back to a normalcy of treating both from the patient point of view and also from the doctor's point of view healthcare profession it is not that's that the, the stigma is not just in the patient the healthcare personnel are also worried as to uh, at what stage they are going to get into this uh, entire uh, covid disease 
Uh, do you think there will be two types of hospitals in the future? One is a COVID hospital and a non-COVID hospital. Uh, those hospitals who are only treating COVID cases and those who are going to uh, treat only non-COVID cases. Uh, I personally believe it has to be done because one of the less, one of the lessons that we have to learn from what has happened in Italy is because they have thrown all the hospitals open and it's almost like majority of the hospitals for treating COVID positive patients. And when you have so many facilities which are, have COVID positive patients, it becomes very, very difficult to prevent this sort of transmission irrespective of how many of our precautions that we take. There are some lacunae because we don't understand this virus completely. There are some lacunae uh, which could still uh, lead to uh, further spread of this uh, virus. So I personally, I, I personally believe that suppose if we have COVID positive patients, I think they have to be treated in a, I mean, separate hospital so that one, you're isolating. The people are also getting trained over and over again. It is not that easy to train these patients. Actually, Rajesh will agree with me that, you know, how difficult it is to train the healthcare personnel to take care of these people, actually. So we should have some particular center, like we have the sub-specialities right now. We have the speciality. So we train these people adequately so that they, and obviously, I'm sure in the days to come, we'll see that patients who are treated in this COVID exclusive hospitals have better results than patients who are treated in a general hospital. Okay, like it's something like you have a, you're, you're doing a procedure over and over again, you become a master in that rather than trying to do it once in a while. So I personally still believe that actually you should have this segregation between COVID positive and COVID negative hospitals. Uh, I would like to ask the Mr. Uh, yes, uh, the same question, the same question that uh, how far are we away from a reversal towards normal living? What do you think from the CDC side? Uh, yeah, um, I can talk about like uh, the I, what might happen with India with this lockdown implementation. So um, you might be aware about the Cambridge study and a lot of other studies with project uh, with uh, modeling projections about like when we will be able to uh, uh, prevent transmission and uh, bring down the curve down uh, if you do intervention like social distancing and if you don't do interventions regarding social di distancing and all. So like the Cambridge study, like it stated, like if you have 21 days lockdown and just you open up everything immediately, slowly again you are to you are going to have an emergence of a big outbreak and surge in number of cases which will run into like it may run into millions of cases again so there there is another theory proposed that if you do the lockdown for 21 days then stop for 5 days like open it for 5 days again do a lockdown for 28 days another 5 give a 5, five days gap and again go like a 18 days uh, lockdown then go for a 28 days lockdown then after that, like after three months, like you will be able to prevent like a lot of infection. The transmission chain can be cut off. So these are modeling projections. And you know very well, like this virus, like we are still studying about this virus. We don't know how long it is going to survey when we don't have any definite treatment. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Velu, for updating about remdesivir. You know, like two days back, we had some interesting thing about chloroquine, but then it was told that the modeling uh, the uh, the uh, selection of the study and the uh, and the method they used was wrong. So we don't know. We don't have a definite treatment. We don't have any vaccine now. So it's very difficult to predict. But lockdown really helps uh, if it is implemented in a strict manner. It helps. Like in, if you see the uh, Chinese uh, Wuhan city, lockdown really helps. In Italy, we are seeing the trend that it's coming down. The, the curve is coming down. The number of cases newly getting reported is coming down. These strategies will definitely help. So, as Sir has uh, like mentioned, like definitely, even we come back, there will be cases getting reported because we don't know what about the herd immunity. How long this person who uh, had this infection, whether he will get a reinfection or not, we don't know. Still, a lot of things are not clear. So, uh, yeah, uh, but. Definitely, the social distancing strategies and things will definitely be very helpful. So, do you think uh, this will be an ongoing, uh, ongoing threat? I mean, pre-COVID era and uh, post-COVID era. We were talking about that. 
um still uh, things are studied about this virus if you see the other covid virus like corona viruses so co corona viruses which is which are causing human infections are there since 1960s so um like uh, recently in 2014 uh, the national entric virus repository and surveillance system from uh, cdc they have commissioned a study for uh, uh, from the repository they tried testing for corona viruses and they have found out like uh, within this period of 2014 to 17 there were nearly a million number of uh, samples which were tested from the repository they tested positive for corona viruses which are very mild but the thing is like we don't know uh, about this virus still things are studied how long this can survive and whether it, it will be continued to be a pandemic we don't know so if you see the corona viruses they started getting like most of the cases getting reported are between december to march whether this will also become seasonal we don't know yet uh, so uh, now we are in a lockdown position international travel is banned almost everywhere now uh, how do you see that in india uh, interstate travel when is it going to happen or is it going to happen in the near, near future because lots of people are getting stranded they got stranded due to the uh, corona virus this lockdown uh, they can't move back to their working places or to their families at all so how do you think this is going to come so even though like i i do understand like this is this is a big problem so many people are stranded in different states and uh, away from their home state but the issue is like even if you open lockdown it cannot be abruptly open like definitely government is also thinking in same times so initially like they will still lockdowns have to be continued in the hot spots there are districts identified by ministry of health and family welfare where the, lock the district lockdowns will still be continuing and preventing the patient uh, the person movements and all because like and in other places slowly slowly it might get lifted i don't know what ministry of health is going to bring in but if it cannot be lifted abruptly like what fine day we cannot tell that like we have to lift so it will be based on the local transmission dynamics like what is happening in different districts and in certain areas like that strategy has to be devised uh thank you dr balan now it's time uh, we take question from the audience who are uh, banging us with questions on uh, many areas i purposefully put up those questions so that most of the areas whatever we have covered are the principal questions which have been asked by the audience there have been some uh, questions which you have not uh, so far asked so i am going to ask one after the other dr uh, rajesh sir what is the current testing method being used by nhs is that the pcr is that the antibody or the rapid test uh karagwel thank you for the question to the audience the current test which is being used in the nhs is the rt pcr the, there are other laboratories at the present time in oxford southampton and liverpool who are looking at antibody testing but that is not the norm at the present time in the uk um now i am going to ask one question a country which is very close to you sweden uh very firmly believes that they don't want to fall into any of the uh, lockdown policies and other things putting one argument in front the earlier the general public develops antibody to this virus it is better for the humanity what is your take on that being a very close country which is not adhering to the lockdown policies of who or whatever what is your take on this getting antibodies rapidly getting exposed to get the public exposed as usual it's like getting common cold you get antibodies and goes away is it a dangerous policy or is it uh, very plausible from their perspective that that's a um, very contentious question and thank you very much karagwel the the um see all these decisions are binary decisions if you think about it nothing is correct and nothing is wrong because we've all now come to a lot of consensus of opinions really a lot of it is not fact you know we 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 have come through this from um november of last year from china we therefore um 
my own personal opinion uh, is that these are countries with small populations. You know, Sweden has a population of some 3.5 to 4 million. Finland is again the same. Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, all of these people have got small populations. And if you really look at what their travel um, you know, uh, systems are, they don't travel a lot outside of their countries. They get a lot of tourism. And the, the view I feel is that they're hoping that they can contain it. They will slowly introduce herd immunity in their own country, and they will contain it in that fashion. Whereas, you know, in a city like London, for instance, with 9 million population, 40% of the people who live in London are migrants, are from overseas. So the, I think that's the reason why the decision uh, may be plausible in, you know, your parlance that, uh, you know, they, they're waiting and watching as to what uh, they need to do. And they're also, they're also away from the rest of Europe. They're in, right up in Northern Europe. And therefore, you know, even for anybody from Southern Europe, like Spain, or, you know, from Middle Europe, like Italy, to go up there is not going to be very easy. So that, that's my personal opinion. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have the same question which I want to ans be answered by Dr. Vijay Kumar Velu and Dr. Kain Mulata. I have many questions of same origin. Do BCG look as a game changer? I'm sure countries which has had or which is still continuing to have BCG vaccination policy seem to have, seem to have, I will undercoat. Do we don't have a controlled data about BCG positivity and uh, COVID positivity? At this point of time, what is the scientific basis and do you agree with this thought at all? Reject my first. Yeah, so I think it uh, uh, looks like uh, the, the countries who adapted the BCG as a vaccination uh, has low incidence of this virus. And we don't have a, a clear peer-reviewed paper showing that this is happening. But then um, when you look at the ch children as a population uh, all across, you know, um, BCG, I mean, implemented countries with the children, I mean, um, uh, vaccination policy. You know, I think there is a, a, a clear evidence that the BCG might protect the lung in a bystander way uh, because uh, as you all know that the BCG uh, uh, itself is a uh, stimulant of innate immunity. So uh, when you have this BCG and when you have a good response, innate as well as adaptive immune response, probably that might actually uh, control other other I mean, that that might be another um, adjuvant factor for um, uh, limiting the coronavirus i think in new york people are trying to uh, vaccinate the healthcare workers uh, with bcg they're trying to do a study to see whether the uh, because we can we can have vaccine for healthcare workers right since with bcg there is a trend showing a low incidence probably that might protect you know i think Getting a vaccine for healthcare workers might work, and then probably we would have to wait. You know, in fact, I am actually doing a study with the uh, 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 an Hyderabad company where this data company, data based company, I told them to uh, look at the incidence of the childhood vaccination, particularly pneumococcal vaccine as well as the BCG, to see whether there is a trend in the lower incidence of this. And I think um, most probably yes. Uh, but you would have to wait for a peer-reviewed paper. Uh, but if BCG is avail available and it can protect your lung, you know, why, why not you take a BCG? And then at least for the healthcare, healthcare workers, you know, if we see the pandemic the way that we have in US, if we, if we translate the same numbers in, in India, first we need to protect the frontline people. The, those are the doctors. You know, the, we need to implement them, uh, advise them to take BCG. Whether they can be protected indirectly. You know, that's my, my my personal opinion as well. Dr. Dr. Chandigal, yeah. Can I just ask one? Yes, uh, sir. Please, sir. Please go actually, ahead. Actually, uh, we have one very expert here, Dr. Chandra Mohan, who's on the panel. I just want to ask him, actually, Chandru, do you think there is any difference between the foregut surgery and the other types of surgery, colorectal surgery and HPV surgery? Because 
being very frank because a forget surgery seems to be more because of the i mean the entire gi tract has got the ace2 receptors that we all agree but the forget surgery do you think will have more complications and do you think forget surgery has to wait a longer time start the other procedures i i mean because of the uh, uh, of the type of uh, diseases that we encounter do you think the forget surgery will have to wait longer as compared to the colorectal surgery or the other types of surgery i'm visible to you now yeah, yeah. i mean audible also yeah, uh, yeah. Really thanks you with the the guidelines for forget surgery the most important guidelines have been brought out by isd with philip chu and uh, pratik sharma the president and they brought in wonderful guidelines for both endoscopy as well as forget surgeries and the next guideline has come from australia and new zealand with the mark smith as the main person two important points they have brought in is one if the patient is borderline resectable definitely subject them for new adjuvant therapy so you are two important things you are gaining the timing of new adjuvant therapy and the time you wait after new adjuvant therapy maybe in that time you will have some clue about how the virus is going to treat us then you can decide whether you are going to continue on the chemo radiotherapy or there is a possibility we can take them up for surgery that is the first thing second thing is even in resectable tumors they are very very guarded in telling if the patient can be pushed for non surgical option it is desirable you push them for non surgical option these are the two important major factors which was brought out last week by both these societies but rajesh i i mean just i'll ask you the same question do you think if you have to prioritize this patient the forget sir surgeries versus the colorectal and hutch the thing in uk what do you think is going to be the policy dr rao thank you for that question um i think it's again going to be mdt decisions just as chandramohan said you know it, it will be the um stage 3 in lung cancer in my specialty uh that we will be looking at trying to buy time with chemo radiation I think with early stage cancer a conversation will be held on an individual patient basis with the um patient and his carers that we could go ahead and perform the operative procedure but if there is a 4 to 5% chance that he or she may develop a complication after surgery they should be prepared for the eventual <laughs> I mean, they they may come through it. We've had some patients who've had um, uh, resections for lung cancer who have become COVID positive and recovered and have left the hospital. But those are all anecdotal um, uh, incidents. But we don't have clear guidelines to say who should be operated and who shouldn't. And again, thank you for uh, uh, informing us about the common sense situation. I mean, the common situation is with the clinician, yeah. with the pathologist, with the um, anesthetist, whether and also the resource of the hospital. Some hospitals, teaching hospitals, will have a larger resource than the district general hospitals. So, if you like, um, I think Chandramohan is absolutely right that buying a window of time. Right. you know by instituting new adjuvant chemotherapy which is probably the standard the gold standard in most cancers at the present time to do that wait for the um a uh, further period of time where you again restage them and then take them on for surgery but sir rajesh this one point i want to make uh, uh, we all know uh, chemotherapy new adjuvant radiotherapy they are all immunosuppressants the patients get immunosuppressed so aren't they more susceptible to covid infection than a normal patient i i completely agree with you that's why the conversation should be between clinician and the patient the patient must understand 
it's a very difficult situation with the patient sitting in front of you with a cancer and asking you what is the best treatment option. And it's, it's, it's a clinician who has to take that responsibility on behalf of the patient and his carer. So it, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy at all. But some, you know, on, in the, on BBC, there were patients who came on, especially I can remember a patient with prostatic cancer who said that it's unfair for him to wait because he thinks that he may have missed his opportunity. So, you know, again, with the NHS, um, fortunately, we are not struggling at the present time, but we may struggle. We don't know. We've had these huge hospitals in uh, London and East London, in NEC, about four miles from where I live in Birmingham, um, where we've opened up. But so far, we haven't had a huge horde of patients coming there. So maybe we are beginning to look at the curve. Maybe. But just to come back to a, um, a comment made you know, about when and when will it become normal, See, this is in, very interesting. It's been a cascade. It started in China. A lot of us didn't even think that anything will happen in this part of the world. And then it, the wave just hit the Southeast Asia and then hit the Middle East and Iran, then hit Europe with Italy, then it's hit us. And it's now hit the United States. We don't know what's going to happen in South America. You know, we don't know whether this is going to be a wave which will go round and round or whether it will stop or whether it will become another uh, winter flu um, uh, you know, uh, situation, just like what happened with MERS and SARS. No idea. Can I add a little? Yes. Yes, Dr. Chandabad. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the question is to ask. We are very clear in understanding the both chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I'll call you back. I'll call you Am I audible, sir? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, now, there are two important aspects you have to consider. One is patient safety, and second one is the curability, third thing is protecting the healthcare. You look at everything, it is uh, accepted all over while you are managing an upper GA cancer, especially esophageal cancer. The standard of form is giving new adjunct therapy. So nobody is going to question you on that point. And that gives enough time for you to decide. On the other hand, instead of chemo radiotherapy, if you want to operate on that patient, you just see how many people are involved in that. The entire operating team, the entire anesthetic team, the nursing staff, the operating theater, and ICU, more so if the patient develops a complication, warranting his stay in ICU for a longer time. So when you outweigh this, the benefit is more. You go on that. You have to analyze the benefit-risk ratio and have MDT meeting and have a discussion with the patient and the family and then take a call. And you will definitely go err on the side of giving new adjuvant than to subjecting them for surgery. First. <laughs> Uh, Karagwil, can we uh, mute? Uh... Karagwil, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. No, you are not audible. I think uh, I'm sorry. I think I will repeat the question. There are a lot of questions from the doc plexus, predominantly on the therapy part of it. So I would like to ask Dr. Hemlata, like uh, the COVID drug targets, the antibiotic per se, which are like antiparasitic agent like ivermectin, what is the role of ivermectin and uh, mefloquine, the long-term uh, quinines uh, in containing the uh, replication of uh, or multiplication of viral bodies? Thanks, Kanagavil. I think they all work under the same principle. I don't think they have got an inherent activity against the virus. What they do is they alter the 
endosomes and the pH of the endosomes and um, thereby potentiate the immunity uh, against or um, the enhanced killing against the virus. I don't think they act directly on the virus. So what we know is there is some effect, there's some benefit, but it's not proven in trials. And therefore, the use of these agents in most countries have been in the context of clinical trials. And some countries like the U.S., um, it purely by desperation, has gone ahead and used in a lot of patients. But I think, as I said, I don't know what the exact action is, but I think the common theme is enhancing your, um, or strengthening your immune response. Um, the other question which is being asked is, um, is there a trial uh, after the experience of uh, Wuhan or after the experience of countries which are relatively safe for the from the morbidity and the incidence perspective, um, are they showing us some light? Uh, I'm sure China has a large experience, Spain has a large experience, Italy has a large experience. This is from the Johns Hopkins data where they say people are declared cured. I'm sure all of us have a big database now, very shortly. Um, do we mean to say the current guidelines of therapeutics for positive patients? Are they going to be the same or we have a direction that is we are evolving to? I think we are evolving. I don't think we have a fair amount of evidence to say, strong evidence to say that, yes, it will work. And, and certainly there's been a lot of observational data, there's flaws in some of the studies, and not to say that it's not fair to condemn those studies, and I think at this point in time, but we don't just have the robust evidence that we need for us to be able to say confidently that this will work. And also we don't know at what dosing, we don't know what the side effects are going to be, we don't know how the host response is going to be. We may be, the Asians may be reacting totally in a different way to what the Caucasians do. So there's no pharmacogenomic data that we have currently. And the recent IDSA guidelines, again, say that this, you can use hydro, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in combination with azithromycin or not, again, in the context of clinical trial. And, and I know many countries are running clinical trial at the moment, as, in, uh, as we are in Australia. But then I, I, the answer to your question is, I think we don't know for sure. The next question from Vijay Kumar Velu, uh, is H1N1 vaccine being tested now for this COVID? Is H1N1 vaccine having some uh, people who have already got H1N1 vaccinated group, are they having some form of protection? Because they are all in the same group of uh, Corona group, rather. There is no data uh, that, that the H1N1 vaccine can protect coronavirus. But the thing is, again, like the way that I said for the BCG, um, no matter what, I mean, flu is also going to be a core, a core uh, factor, right? So I think to keep you safe with the, uh, the vaccine that is available, if you vaccinate yourself with the vaccine that is there for a different virus, it probably may protect it pro yourself more. But there is no data that is a... There is no data at all uh, to show that the H1N1 will protect coronavirus. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Dr. Raghunathan, can you unmute yourself? You wanted to ask a question and please ask your question, sir. Please unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, uh, just I want to ask, uh, being a physician, I want to know the surgeon's perspective. Uh, today we know that 80% uh, of the people who are infected are having only asymptomatic or only mild symptomatic. Only 10 or 15 may require admission. So in that case, in future, if these 80 percent are going to have some medical, I mean, surgical emergencies, and in invariably when they are going to test, the antibody may be positive, or even your RT PCR may be positive. So, what is the strategy? Are we going to deprive them the surgical interventions, or what is the strategy? For example, you are talking about dedicated COVID hospital. So far, we have not thought on the surgical aspects. So maybe that COVID dedicated COVID hospital can have an emergency theater also, so that any patient like this can be operated in the dedicated theater also. So I want the other people to respond to this issue. Dr. Rajesh, please. <laughs> I think the answer to that question is if somebody has been asymptomatic, 
he probably has in some sort of immune immunity i don't know but on the other hand if he comes in will my country my government have the resource to test everyone just like you do a uh, basic test before surgery um as baseline whether they will include covid-19 is a point to debate um and i'm not so sure that we will um be in a position to do that you know i think we just have, uh, if there is symptomatic I'd, i'd like the opinions of the virologists as well who are on the panel there is symptomatic just treat them as any other person um who comes in for an emergent surgery or an urgent surgery or any other surgical procedure be it diagnostic or be it um uh therapeutic you know i i i really don't see any reason why we should now um you know isolate people into covid positive and covid negative in society your point is taken so now i like to hear from dr gv uh, rao before going to the virologist what is your take on it because in nhs they are still continuing to offer the surgical services in india we have stopped surgical services except for emergency but the road for us are going to be meeting together same at some point of time we also have to open up for elective surgeries what is your take for the question of uh, the physician which have thrown us up it's a very good question i think uh, i i don't think we can deny these patients who have developed obviously subclinical patients or ppp people who have had uh, the suboptimal infections actually over the period of time they have developed their immunity i don't think you can deny these patients of any surgery but obviously we have to wait i don't think it can be an individual decision i think we have to have a collective decision uh, from the societies from the virologist to see whether uh, how far these patients will be infective non infective suppose if the if you understand this virus very well and the vir- virologist tells us okay at this stage these patients are not infective then i think we can absolutely go ahead and take this patient like we are taking all the precautions for the other viral markers that we are doing right now uh, but till that time that we have a clear understanding of the disease i think we should i mean it is basically is absolutely we don't know how this virus behaves in different individuals different parts of the world so i think i i personally believe that as as on today we should take adequate precautions uh, to protect both the healthcare personnel and the patient so till we understand the whole thing completely i think we should take all precautions uh, make sure that these patients are isolated treated separately and uh, and as we gather more than more information from across the globe and experience from people from across the globe i think uh, the guidelines keep changing the statements keep changing i think i think we can change as per what is coming uh, up every day thank you sir before moving on to the wire just last question for the evening uh, dr valan uh, i am sure we eventually happen to open up both the economy and the healthcare and people had eventually have to get back to normalcy but to get into the opening up phase the first important thing is the transport and travel of people across at this point of time uh, the most major transport services which are going to open up is railway first then the air travel initially domestic and control international that's what the plan uh, laid out by the government so i am talking from an individual perspective if you are asked to travel what are the precautions you have to take especially on the immediate phase when you open up the lockout what are the precautions one should take if you are planning to travel and if you are if it is unsafe to travel how long you have to wait to say traveling is safe this is the question by one of the participants okay so w- what are the precautions you should take what when the travel is allowed so the standard precautions like for any public so already th- they have advised about the social distancing that has to continue so that has to continue beyond the lockdown period also and so hand washing uh, as a public health message this has already been communicated because this prevents uh, if you have the virus you touch some, somewhere and somebody else touches it will again augment the transmission amplify the transmission that has to 
continue second thing is now government of india and also cdc has advised about the public masking right so we have 80% of the people who are mildly symptomatic and asymptomatic they can be a potential source for spreading the infection to others so ministry of health also now come out with the cloth masking not the surgical masking but the cloth cloth masking or a face cover as a public health measure if you are asymptomatic then you are not going to spread infection to others while you are coughing or sneezing so these are the like some simple measures which will really help in preventing transmission when the uh, the lockdowns are open and for the healthcare facilities still every healthcare facility should have a triaging point because we don't know who is the covid patient who is the covid patient and we have 80% of the people who are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic so all the facility should have a triage facility where the symptomatics will be immediately separated and they will be further examined by a clinician for sending to a covid designated place or not so these are some things which might help thank you sir can i request our president uh, raman goel to give his comments before we have the closing remarks from dr sainda okay karan goel i think a very interesting discussion some of the points that i noticed uh, one of the thing is about this strategy to operate and to test or not to test it's not a question of the cost alone it's a question of false sense of security a negative test gives to the team so you may you may say that you we will use all the precautions in every patient but if it's a negative test somebody in the ward may not use a adequate ppe so is it really worth the effort and then the second issue that was raised just now was about the antibodies giving immunity we don't even know that that if somebody has antibodies does that mean that person is immune to covid or or does he that person is still have a have a virus in the throat and uh, so uh, we maybe the virologist can can talk about it does the antibody test means that there is no active virus in the throat or lung secretions so i think these these are the issues about a strategy to operate which which is important about this uh, tough decisions i am i am really wary of this you know nhs has a excellent documentation system but what happens in indian hospitals when you delay somebody's surgery and adequate records are not there what are the going to be the legal challenges six months down the line one year down the line it's not about the patient alone maybe is child or grandchild may come up with a legal challenge and the courts may go in their favor that so i think there has to be some kind of immunity for uh, for medical teams because like uh, like we heard from italy that the 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 intensivists decided who should be get a ventilator who should be let go because they thought uh, life is not not that precious as a young person's life now i'm not talking about those extreme diseases i'm talking about something like a staging in oncology or a pancreatitis patient whether we do cholecystectomy now or we wait for another one year or uh, till the thing settle down so i think there are serious issues about dr rao raising this issue about covid versus non covid hospitals i think assam has shown this model in assam government hospitals are covid hospitals private hospitals are non covid hospitals they have a arrangement and which is at the moment working well and the government hospitals are augmenting their capacity even though they have very few patients in assam at the moment so i think maybe other states can have a look at that model to 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 improve things uh, one question that i wanted to ask was about the investments so first to uh, mr rajesh uh, do you have a negative pressure operation theaters do, are the uh, as you say the surgeries are still going on are those who those who are doing minimally invasive surgeries are they using hepa filters or ulpa filters in every case because we know that they there they can be aerosolization so what is happening there and then we'll go to dr g v rao who is going to make this investments in india so what's happening in uk i this 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 was a question which um was raised in the webinar and the main guys who were talking about it were orthopedic surgeons because they use a lot of laminar flow and some of them uh, some of the other specialties use negative pressure this this if you like is being monitored and is still carrying on and using of filters is also being done but i am not so sure as to um whether they are running at full capacity or whether again it's resource implication as to whether we should be looking at it closely 
with each individual case. The other interesting um, data that we've got is that the number of patients who are showing up is decreasing. The number of patients who um, have come with uh, suspicions of MI has gone down by 28%. So is this because of social distancing? Is this because people are taking this so seriously in the UK that people who are actually ill are not coming to the hospital because they fear of getting COVID? Okay. So, you know, we also have are trying to put together some ethical questions as to how um, indemnity will be taken forwards. Because like you very rightly said, in Italy, they were making decisions about uh, who should go on the ventilator and who shouldn't. It's the same holds good for the UK. Patients who have got cancer, patients who have got um, stage four disease, who get these in, in hospital during treatments when they go for their oncological treatments, what do we do with them? Yeah. So some ethical issues about the long-term survival of some of these patients, whether we should make any um, decisions about them. If we made those decisions, what happens to the medical personnel? What happens to the trust of the hospital which uh, makes these decisions? So. And those indemnifiers in the uh, NHS is something that we'll be we looking at, and it's crucial. Okay. And uh, Dr. Goel, the same holds good for the UK. The private hospitals are being used for the non-COVID operative procedures as well. We have farmed out a lot of the work there. But what you must understand is that that isn't a sterile area either. <laughs> you can <laughs> probably get COVID over there too, because the staff who operate there are people from the NHS. Okay. The surgeons, the anesthetists who go over to operate also work in the NHS. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, can, I, can I ask just one last question? Please, sir. Please, sir. Please go ahead. So, uh, GV, uh, a quick question. You know, you, you are in a busy private setup. The, the elective surgeries have gone, consultations have gone. Are we not looking at a situation where these private hospitals will get sick? Why healthcare industry is not asking for a bailout package from the government right now before it goes to the airline industry or before it goes to the hospitality? Private hospitals who have to invest in negative pressure operation theaters, we don't have a single operation theater negative pressure. Absolutely. Dedicated absolutely. corridors for COVID positive patients. How much money is going to be invested in private hospitals besides the financial loss that's already happening? Uh, it's, it's a very good question, but I, I don't think uh, it is like uh, our profession is taken, uh, the medical profession, I don't think this question will ever, ever come because uh, the lives comes first. I don't think the medi this, the question of whether we can sustain or not will be the last question that will be asked in the economic of uh, discussion. I personally believe after all the discussions are over, the medical things will come. So till that time, I don't think we can talk on humanitarian ground also. We cannot talk about it. As far as your negative uh, pressure theaters are concerned, I think what you said was absolutely right. Not many uh, facilities have this sort of uh, facility. But I, I, again, the, the Royal College has beautifully laid out some guidelines. They said at least switch off the positive pressure in the theater uh, during the procedure and at, at least for about 20 minutes till the patient is shifted out from the theater. That's a very beautiful guideline. We don't have negative pressure, but at least we can curtail that by taking some precautions, whatever we have in the existing facility. Uh, your question is absolutely right. I think even if the associations raise this, the uh, hospital associations raise this, I don't think we'll have an answer for this right now. I think the hospital industry comes the last. I think uh, patients are the priority first. I think we have to tackle this, get over this crisis. Then I think we can talk about the hospital crisis. Okay. Thank you, Karangir. Thank you. Um, one uh, last question. In fact, uh, I would like to ask two uh, panelists here. Uh, Rajesh, sir, the, like in a crisis situation, like what New York is facing or what Spain and Italy has been facing, uh, 
there is a medical triaging for covid patients as some right now sometime back you are speaking about who will get treated and who will not get treated especially when they need a intubate uh, intubation or so is there going to be medical triaging for these patients when they get into the hospital for medical care for covid what is the policy government is taking especially if there is a flood of patients what is going to be the uh, directive by the government on medical triaging who gets care and who do not get care do nhs have any thought process on this think, um as i said when we started this whole thing is so dynamic that decisions um backroom conversations are going on on a daily basis between the <clears throat> chief medical officers or the royal colleges and we're coming out with statements so i think the next step as far as we are concerned in the uk is for these very large hospitals that we have put together we will start filling the hospital in london if we have overflows and the way i believe that these overflows are going to be dealt with are these are people who are getting better who can be shifted to the excel center and be weaned off the ventilator then the patients who go into hospital like you said a sort of a triage you know if these are people who are in their 80s 90s and who have comorbid conditions who have got uh, you know uh, limited um if you like lifespan um you know those kind of decisions will be taken because thus far out of the patients who have succumbed to this disease um about 80% of these patients have been above the age of 70 and of this about 50% have been above the age of 80 so it's obvious that it's hit a population with a lot of comorbidity the younger group is small but they are highlighted by the press if somebody who's 30 or somebody who's 21 for a variety of reasons pass away these are also patients who have got some sort of congenital or chronic problems it's only the healthcare workers who have been hit by this front line are the people who have succumbed who are young and who don't have many comorbidities so i think the medical triaging will come but when and how it will be implemented is a million dollar question thank you sir uh, what is the australian perspective hema to close with so kanaga well we we do have covid and non covid hospitals and um, among the covid hospitals we have two zones um the orange and the red zone the orange zone is for patients um who are well and who don't um require ventilation support and so on and the red zone is um a severe covid area so medical triaging wise as you said um yes we do accept patients in non covid areas but the elephant in the room is testing how do you determine someone as to where to send to whether you know they have to go to the covid hospital or whether to go to the orange zone or the red zone so we we still don't run a turnaround time of less than 24 hours unfortunately so we do have that problem and as um uh, uh dr rajesh pointed out we do have a triaging where we do talk about advanced care options and and if someone is for advanced no advanced uh care and then they you know the decision is taken at that point uh we don't go for non invasive ventilation or um any aerosol generating procedures we isolate them in ward um but if they are for one then obviously a decision is made at that point in time as to how severe it is and wh- how likely the ventilation is going to be required and if it is then they are transported to the covid hospital so um and so a similar system of triage but at this point in time i think we are sort of managing and we haven't come to a point where we have to um think twice about who to intubate and who to not thank you uh with that uh, i think vijay kumar will give a final point before we close no i have a question Please, sir i have a close question to the yes, finish so you all treat patients uh, i'm sorry you have patients and then um, you 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 treat them with some drugs or so when how do you determine to let them go out what is the factor that you see 
that the, these patients can be discharged. Because that's this boils down to a question uh, Dr. Gheol asked actually, because um, here we, people discharge based on their uh, viral load. And then I don't think they will have viral load when they are discharged. And then uh, the plasma has been collected from them and then being uh, given to the severe patient. So uh, if the virus stays there for a while, what is what is your because in a, the reason why I'm trying to uh, ask this question is like we have one study uh, came from China where they infected monkeys with the virus and then after uh, uh, like two weeks the virus went down completely and then they reinfected multiple times there is no virus the, the virus, monkey did not pick the virus so I feel you know if the discharge is based on a clear evidence that the virus is not there in the system. Uh, probably we can isolate B cells from there or antibodies from those patients and implement as a therapy. That's what I'm. I, I feel. But then again, I I just want to confirm whether what is the criteria anybody said to let the patient go out of the clinic. So, Kanagavel, I can answer that question yes. if you like. Yes. Um, so, so every country has got a clearance criteria, and I'm sure India will have one. But in Australian setting, we say when the patient is ready for discharge based on clinical criteria, um, they can go in for home isolation and it is till 14 days from the time of symptoms. So we assume that after that, they are unlikely to be infected. And that is true again to answer multiple questions that um, arose during this conference is that um, the, we, we know that the virus doesn't, although it can be detected, it doesn't grow in culture after eight days, around eight to 10 days. And this essentially means that um, this unlikely transmission event that can be expected after this particular time point. So we have to be pragmatic at some point in time. And therefore in Australia, we're looking at shortening that um, isolation um, timeline because we realize that the healthcare workers who are precious to the industry, we are losing them for 14 days. Um, and one other thing that, that might be reviewed is testing, apart from isolation, testing for um, a negative swab, negative by RNA. We need at least two negative swabs uh, in a, a matter of uh, 24 hours time point. And again, that's very contentious. And I, as a microbiologist, don't believe in that because I, I know that the virus can linger around, particularly the DRNA can linger around for a while. So that's something that Australia might review after a time point. But at this stage, I think it's we do have criteria. And to answer the other related question about how do we know that the patient is immune, um, the Europeans have actually put out a specific guidelines for who to, uh, um, uh, what plasma to use for therapy. Um, so anyone who is willing to donate their plasma after convalescent um, time is to have a one in 320 teeter of antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. So which means that the antibodies should be able to neutralize the antigens in vivo, in sorry, in vitro grown on cell cultures at a level of one in 320. And that is when you call a serum or a, a sorry, plasma as an effective plasma. But that is pretty difficult and it's not practical, I think. But if we start developing a bank, say for example, that's something that we can think about once we de develop a laboratory capacity. Yeah, so how long this these patients are positive? Like apart from uh, the portal? Yeah, so oh. in my experience, um, I have seen patients going on with a good going CT values. In other words, increased viral loads up to 21 days. And the latest reported is 28 days. And the, the, the primary sample is the nasal swab. Yes, okay. correct. So, so your nasopharyngeal or throat swabs initially, um, around day one to day five, in that in that time period, you are running at around ten to the power of six six log viral load. Yeah, and that very slowly diminishes. And it's interesting that once you start forming your IgM IgG antibodies, the viral load start start of starting to diminish. Um, I don't know whether it's due to neutralization, but that's when you start seeing a drop in the viral load, but your DNA linger, uh, sorry, the RNA lingers around. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Thank you. Iman. Thank you, Vijay Kumar. May I now request uh, Dr. Sainder, the chairman, to give the concluding remarks, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the panelists, for a wonderful discussion we had today. 
uh, I'll just make a few points just to sum it up. Uh, the first point is all patients should be assumed COVID positive until proved otherwise. That is a beautiful statement that has been made. Uh, secondly, full protection for all of us, all healthcare workers is absolute necessary for the safety, both for the patient and for the healthcare worker. That is very important. Thirdly, testing. There are two aspects of testing. The more you test, the better it is, but it needs huge resources, which India does not have. So testing has to come. Uh, India is doing more testing, but more is necessary. I don't know what is going to happen. And the type of test, I think there should be some new sort of test coming uh, should come up, which is more accurate, faster and cheaper. That is a wishful thinking. I don't know what's happening that the scientists can say. And lastly, uh, there is this COVID and non-COVID hospital concept, which has also come up in ASAM, and I think other states should uh, adopt it. And uh, more, we have to care for the normal patients who are non-COVID, and they need routine surgeries. NHS is continuing with routine surgeries. We have stopped it just to save our resources. And vaccination, as I understand, is long way off, not less than one year, as I understand. And the HCQ is a controversial issue, but it is being used and it is getting good results. Some people are claiming in India. Uh, it's exhausted. No, you can't get an HCQ in the shop. Uh, it is being widely used and misused also. So that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, on record, I like to thank AGS president and the entire leadership for permitting me to assemble this panel. And I would like to put the records of the effort of Professor Chandra Mohan to get uh, Dr. Rajesh and the team uh, with us. And uh, I would take personal efforts to thank uh, Rajesh for uh, being patient all through the day. I think for this couple of hours uh, plan, he has spent almost full day with us coming for trials and other things. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. And uh, we hope IAGS and RCSA continues to have good relationship on an academic basis. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the Emory University group, Dr. Vijay Kumar Velu who is a translational research scientist for uh, staying with us. In fact, when we called him up for trial, it was 3 a.m. in the morning and he was kind enough to come for the trial. Uh, thank you once again. IADS values the relationship with the Emory University and the Erkis Primate Research Center. And we hope uh, in the near future, we'll have more academic interactions with Emory University. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hema, we IITS thanks the new uh, NSW University and the Hunter Hospital team, especially the microbiology and the clinical microbiology unit. I'm sure uh, we have uh, learned a lot of virology, the surgeons and the physicians who are watching from the doc plexus, who have learned a lot of virology from both of you. And I'm sure uh, this will definitely help as surgeons to have the right roadmap. Dr. GV has been our uh, mentor and uh, who's been always kind enough to share his resources for any academic activity. In fact, uh, I definitely can uh, take his help at any point of time. And he's always a big help for any academics. And uh, his association with IAGS academics the last few years have been very commendable for endoscopic programs and advanced laparoscopic program. I'm sure AAG and IAGS will do more academic endeavors together, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. Wallen, who is the uh, head of uh, infection IPC team of the CDC, and uh, he has been very kind. In fact, he in fact wanted to bring in more faculty, I'm sure, but then uh, this is the first uh, big uh, effort. So I'm sure possibly in the near future, his bosses and other people were also keen. In, but uh, we definitely had certain limitations having more and more people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wallen, for sharing the possible uh, track which the country is going to take and CDC is going to take. I thank you. I thank Professor Chandramohan. 
and i thank all the executive committee leaders of iags present president and the past presidents of iags the trustees the advisors and the founder and the last member of iags for stimulating us for more academic endeavors in fact i should thank the kritika and nitin from the doc plexus in fact we had a flawless connectivity and i am sure uh, dr sumit shah has taken care of the facebook live there are a lot uh, uh, there are a lot of people who have uh, logged in through the facebook live also and the entire technical team which was behind the doc plexus transmission for making this event a perfect web based event thank you one and all with that permission of the president of iags i would like to call the meeting to a close and uh, we will sign off one by one thank you everyone thank you so much thank you all thank you all thank you so thank much thank you <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Thank you, Hema. Thank, Thank you, Raman sir. Thank you, Sainda sir. Thank you, Vijay Kumar sir. Thank you, GV sir.